How was life in Europe affected by early globalization? The Rembrandt House in Amsterdam provides us with some answers. In 1658, the famous Dutch painter Rembrandt filed for bankruptcy in Amsterdam. One happy consequence of his ill fortune is that a list of Rembrandt's sold possessions has survived. It includes a number of fascinating objects, such as exotic seashells, a Japanese helmet, Indonesian furniture, as well as bows and arrows from India. Rembrandt's collection of objects from distant lands demonstrates that the encounter with new worlds left tangible traces on life in 17th century Europe. 150 years earlier, commodities like these would have been unimaginable to an average household in Amsterdam. Yet Rembrandt's fascination for the exotic also prompts a larger question about how to assess the impact of early globalization. Historians in the past have mapped European global expansion and examined its political, its economic and cultural effects in Asia, Africa and the Americas. Yet how is life in Europe itself affected by these developments? I would like to explore this question by examining the case of the Dutch Republic, one of the leading maritime powers of the early modern period. Grown out of a rebellion against the Spanish Habsburg monarchy, the newborn Dutch Republic of the Netherlands experienced remarkable economic progress in the 17th century. Its main city of Amsterdam in particular developed into one of the leading commercial centers of the age. And while much of their trade was focused on Europe, the Dutch also expanded their interests globally. Fueled by the military rivalry with Spain, the Dutch established chartered merchant companies, which infiltrated Iberian trading networks in the West and the East Indies. So by the mid 17th century, the Dutch seaborne empire stretched from the Americas, including present day New York, Brazil, Suriname, to Africa, along the Slave Coast and Cape Town, and most importantly Asia, particularly the Indonesian islands, the coast of India and Sri Lanka and Japan. How exactly life in the Dutch Republic was affected by these growing global interactions, I would like to demonstrate through three examples, migration, lifestyle and science. First, it's clear that Dutch enterprises overseas required the employment and movement of thousands of people. With a population of about one million, the Dutch Republic was far too small to build and maintain a permanent global presence. Hence, international migration to the Netherlands was vital for its overseas expansion. Cities such as Amsterdam, Haarlem and Rotterdam developed into hubs of religious refugees, labour migrants and travellers from all over Europe. In some areas, immigrants constituted half of the Dutch urban population in the 17th century. Many newcomers found employment at the shipyards of trading companies. Others used Dutch ports to continue their travels overseas. We know, for example, that the Dutch East Indian Company, the VOC, transported no less than a million people to its Asian enterprises during the 17th and the 18th centuries, and more than half of them concerned foreigners. In addition, the Dutch merchant companies in Asia and in the Atlantic engaged in a large-scale slave trade to run their plantations, factories and fleets across the world. So it's fair to say that international migration, voluntary or coerced, provided the backbone of Dutch global trade and that the same migration subsequently transformed Dutch society itself. Second, the impact of globalization is visible in changing habits and lifestyle. Foreigners who visited the Dutch Republic regularly commented on its recently acquired wealth. One could purchase virtually any known commodity on the streets of Amsterdam. Shifting taste, food habits and material culture are particularly visible in paintings of the period. Seemingly straightforward as some of these still life pictures may look, they reveal the Dutch fascination 
for Chinese porcelain, exotic seashells, Persian tapestries and peppers and spices from Asian islands. The frequent inclusion of black men, sometimes portrayed as mere stereotypes, also remind us of the racial implications of early globalization. Third, global interactions had less tangible, more soft, but no less profound effects on knowledge, ideas and mentalities. The encounter with exotic civilizations, with different belief systems and unknown crops and species, captivated but also worried many contemporaries. In short, they presented a new worldview, one that seemed to challenge biblical teachings of the natural world, and which were difficult to reconcile with long-established practices in science, in medicine and technology. The psychological effects of this confrontation with the exotic other were never straightforward. On the one hand, it encouraged scholars to experiment with new, more empirical approaches to science. The Dutch Republic was one of the epicenters of what has been called the scientific revolution, and its prominence in global trade certainly contributed to this. Local universities eagerly collected tropical plants and species, thus integrated old and new knowledge. And yet on the other hand, these exercises in collecting and scholarship also served to reassert a sense of Christian and European superiority. A belief in racial hierarchies and in cultural inequality were both the outcome and the justification of early globalization. This gradual transformation of the Dutch and by extension the European mindset would have dramatic and lasting consequences for world history.